you very much and uh, good morning everyone and uh, the beautiful state of Kentucky. I was just there a month ago, uh, spent uh, an afternoon in Lexington, a wonderful city, wonderful state you have there and very honored to uh, share the experiences the Washtenaw County Road Commission has uh, developed in the roundabouts. I met Mike Vaughn uh, about two years ago. Uh, we had a symposium here in Michigan where we invited different uh, DOTs from across the country to come and see for themselves the roundabouts that we built, the smaller types of roundabouts that we built and get a firsthand experience to learn if, if this is something that they should consider uh, if, if it's right for them to put in their communities. And apparently Mike and his team thought it was a good idea because they are in Elizabethtown uh, uh, conducting one right now. And I believe it is open to traffic now. So uh, well done, Mike, kudos to you. And uh, hopefully it's the first of many to come in your state and maybe others uh, desire to follow in your lead. So with that, um, hit the continue button here. The outline for today, uh, Janet, can you see every my screen okay? Yep, looks good. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, so outline for today, we'll talk about why do we want to build roundabouts? Why should you consider some roundabouts? Well, that too, but why would you wanna consider building smaller roundabouts? And how can you minimize those costs associated with the footprint that is designed for that intersection? We'll start in the beginning here in Washtenaw County that kind of kicked everything off as to how we got to where we are today with the, the intersection of Pontiac Trail and Seven Mile, which then went over into the textile minis. We'll talk about Baker Road, which for anyone that's in the uh, transportation cabinet in Kentucky on this line or does business with them, uh, you might be interested in this roundabout because I think it's a perfect scenario for any DOT across the country to consider uh, to utilize uh, in, in specific areas. I'll, I'll touch on some trade-offs because these are not bulletproof. They do have a few drawbacks. As long as you understand what you're getting yourself into, um, then good for you. And then we'll talk about my, opinions are of the recipe for right-sizing success. So a little humor here. This is how uh, one in the low bid system starts a roundabout project when there's a signal there. Um, this is how you take the signal down within 30 seconds. Quick, efficient, boom, done. Gotta love the low bid system. I found that on LinkedIn one time and I just found that too hilarious not to share with people. So I stripped it off of it and been using it ever since. So the saying goes, there's two sides to every coin. We all have been to a presentation where someone's gone up to the podium and they've tried to sell us something. And they're trying to convince us that what they have to say is the greatest thing since pants with pockets. And I'm here to tell you that although I do believe the Washtenaw County Road Commission believes and, and feels like we're in the doing the right thing by implementing smaller roundabouts at the right intersection, I want everyone to understand that just because it works here in Washtenaw County doesn't necessarily might mean it, it may not work in your community based, based upon certain circumstances. So I want to share all those experiences. I want to be open and transparent about what I believe to be the truths of, of the roundabouts themselves. So you and your hometowns and your counties and your what, whatever jurisdiction you reside over can determine if these are right for you. So you know exactly uh, what to expect should you uh, desire to follow in the lead of Mike and I. So a little bit of background here in Washtenaw County here in Michigan. We're just out, I'd say relatively outside of Detroit. Wayne County is where Detroit uh, resides. We're right next door to the west of Washtenaw. County seat is Ann Arbor. I am a Spartan, so I like to make fun of Wolverines. If any Wolverines on this call, I'm sorry. Uh, population 367,000 uh, is our uh, last census. We have uh, almost uh, 1,650 centerline miles of which MDOT has about 600 of those uh, lane miles. And we have a total of 28 roundabouts of all sizes here in Washtenaw. The map you here see that we have really a blend of both urban and rural in Washtenaw. The blue is our federal urban boundary map. So that's where we get our federal aid urban dollars from and everything outside of that is rural. So you can see we really have the best of both worlds uh, where we have the very rural that you would see out in the bluegrass areas out in the rural part, but also say the Lexington areas where you have that more commercial development around the, the in and around the region. Those dots that you see with the uh, yellow and uh, 
purple bullseyes, those are our what I'll call mini or smaller roundabouts. Now, when I say mini or smaller, it's one and the same. I don't want anyone to get hung up on it. And I'm talking about in the range of 90 to 110. Technically, with FHWA, if you read their manual, they would say a mini is anything from 90 and below. And that's true. And then they, they develop a second term, compact urban, for those that are from 90 to 110. I'm just going to throw them all in, in the same bunch. When I say smaller, I say mini, all the same, 90 to 110. So please don't get hung up on terminology for this presentation. Okay, so why smaller roundabouts? Well, for really from my standpoint, it's because we can't afford the status quo. Um, the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1987 was the last time when the federal gas tax those dollars that we put in at the gas tax at the pumps that go to DC and then goes into the giant formula as far as who's a donor state, who gets more um, back to the states. Well, you know, that, there's been a 60% increase in inflation since 1997 when we're paying still what I believe 18 and a half cents or 18.3 cents per gallon. If money were no option, this is the first roundabout I built. You can see that's about an ICD. And oh, by the way, for those on this call, ICD, if I say that, that's the diameter of the roundabout, inscribed circular diameter. So just consider it as the diameter. That intersection you see there is roughly about 150. If money were no object and I had a million, a million and a half dollars to throw at every single intersection, um, great. Uh, the types of, you know, the traditional size roundabouts of 130, 140, 150 would be wonderful. But the fact of the matter is we can't continue doing business as usual. Labor has gone up, inflation materials has gone up, and we can't do what we did with the dollar in 1997 and expect to have the same value in 2021. I'm skeptical. I do not think that the increases are going to be coming from D.C. Uh, sometimes states do step them up and, and increase their state tax, which is great. But, you know, every dollar counts. I think it's not a matter of doing more with less. It's just being more resourceful for what we have. And that's what this presentation is all about for, for the uh, mini roundabout experience. So how can one reduce the cost, but not its effectiveness? From my standpoint, it's really threefold. One, here in Washtenaw County, we try to do less earthwork. Now, when money is no object, um, back, you know, back in the day, the gold standard, so to speak, was you dig down to clay grade or something harder than that. If you have something different, the soils in Kentucky here in Michigan, we got a lot of clay and you, you build back up from there on a firm base. So you're out, you're hauling all that material away. Well, reality is, is this material is not bad and I can increase my structural number of my pavement by keeping it in place and just using that asphalt, uh, milling it up grinding it up and using this part of my base material and pushing around as needed. So we take what I like to call a giant uh, rotor tiller, as you see there, a pulverizer. We crush and shape that pavement and put it where we need to and just use it as part of our base and then we pave over that. So that's one way you do that. Second way to minimize costs, from my perspective, less storm sewer always saves you money. So the approaches on these roundabouts do have curb and gutter, but I minimize that curb and gutter runs to say 250 to 300 feet. And then I use what we call spillways where the water's directed out and then into a ditch. Anytime you got a lot of um, utilities at intersection, you have a lot of pipe in an intersection that takes time, that takes money. And that's what's gonna drive up your price. Less pipe, more ditches, is an opportunity for you to save dollars. Now in an urban area, that's not possible. And I understand that. And you'll see within my Baker Road experience how you can, you can do other things with that. But when you're in a suburbia type ur uh, uh, rural area, try to do spillways and ditches if you can. <clears throat> and then production paving. Roundabouts are not production paving. By production paving, what I mean is the paver hooks up to the flow boy, uh, which the asphalt comes out of the back, the, the live system, and off it goes to the races. And it's doing a mile at a time. And then they turn around and do the other side. That, that's production paving, but roundabouts are not. So that smaller footprint, if they can do that type of work within a half day with their labor and their force, so they either they come there in the afternoon or start there in the morning and then go to another job site, they're able to build their time to another crew, for their crew to another job. Uh, for that day. But if you have it, so it's more or less over a half day and it goes into, you know, they're going to charge you for a full day. So full of work, even though maybe you only did six hours. So from that standpoint, try to keep it within that smaller footprint. If you can, we'll give you uh, a, a better deal on your asphalt from my perspective. All right. 
So let's start where Pon the, the story begins at Pontiac Trail and Seven Mile Road. So once upon a time in the beginning, uh, this was an all-way stop controlled intersection. And the ICD, so that diameter, was a hunt. We designed this intersection to have a traditional roundabout for 140 feet, as you see there. And the goal was to increase capacity because there was a lot of backups at the daytime, in the morning and afternoons, because it's a bedroom community connecting to Ann Arbor on Pontiac Trail Road. Well, there's a party store, a convenience store, if you want to, I don't know what you call them in Kentucky, we call them party stores here in Michigan, where they have liquor and chips and pop and cola. Uh, that type of stuff. So that, that is on the northeast corner there. And we're like, okay, well, we're, we're not interested in buying the farm. You can see the parcel is fairly small. So in order to reduce the amount of impacts on that, we had to shift the, the center of that roundabout over to the west, which was commercial undeveloped land, zone commercial. Well, the problem that we ran into is <laughs> we weren't expecting this part, but when we went through the appraisal process at the beginning, we were realizing that it's going to cost us a little bit more than we anticipated in order to purchase the land needed to build that footprint, that 140 uh, ICD footprint. And it came out to the tune of about $100,000, which is money we did not have budgeted. On top of that, the property owner for that pretty much held us hostage and said, no, nope, I want $300,000 and I can prove it. And I'm not giving you an iota and you're going to, we're going to go to court and fight this thing out. Well, the reality is, is we didn't have the $100,000. They wanted three hundred. dollars We're like, we're not even close. So ultimately, we, what we ended up having to do was take the money for this CMAC job and return it back to the feds. Here's some data that was on this. Pontiac Trail had 7,600 vehicles per day. Seven Mile Road, 4,600 vehicles per day. The speed limit coming into it, 55 miles an hour. So yes, the, from the standpoint of, uh, you know, Roundabouts are really good at focusing on the speeds, reducing that speeds in from 20 to 55 down to 25 so that you're reducing those high impact, uh, you're, you're having uh, sideswipe low speed collisions if and when they occur within a roundabout where injuries don't happen. That's the beauty of why roundabouts uh, can be a lifesaver and can be a benefit for your community over a traditional signalized intersection. And that's not to say that you shouldn't be using signals. I'm here. To, I'm not. I'm the first person to say the signals do have a purpose and a place still, but sometimes the roundabout is a better choice. So here's the example. I got a little bit ahead of my story here, and uh, sorry about that. So we needed a total of 0.55 acres of right away. The appraisal, like I said, 100,000. The owner sought 300,000. We had to cancel the project. So it was a disappointment to say the least. And it stood there uh, as an always stop controlled intersection for another seven years. So I'll, I'll leave it at that point and I'll get back to that at the end of the presentation. So that was a disappointment, but you know, life happens and that's what you just have to deal with it and move on. So six months later, we're gonna, we're gonna move to the intersection of Textile, Hitchingham and Stony Creek. This is in Ypsilanti Township in Michigan, uh, Washtenaw County. And my, my bosses came to me and they asked me, hey Mark, what should we do with this intersection? Should we put a signal and a roundabout? So here's the layout of those two intersections. Now you see it's three intersections total. Uh, Textile Road goes from left to right. Stony Creek Road's on the angle. Hitchingham Road goes up and down north-south. We're only focused here at the Textile, Stony Creek, and Textile uh, and uh, Hitchingham intersection. Stony Creek and Hitchingham was not part of the scope of work. And I thought back to when they asked me that question, should we signalize it or not? I said, well, you know, guys, we, we went through this exercise kind of already. And I'm questioning if we learned anything from the right-of-way experience because there's some similarities here. And I'd hate for us to have to go down the same you know, path only to have to stop, turn around and, and you know, have egg on our face. So when they asked me the question, I said, what about a mini roundabout? And everyone in the in the room looked at me and like I had a third eye on my forehead, like, what are you crazy, Mark? And I had to explain to them the concept from a gentleman named Wei Zhang. Wei Zhang, for some of you that may know him, he's with Federal Highways. Uh, he is out of the Virginia office. He is in charge of the mini roundabout program at Federal Highway uh, Agency. And I saw a presentation uh, that he had on it. And I thought to myself, you know what, I should ask him, we should ask him if you know, I, I think it's going to work and we can confirm to him if it will work. So they said, all right, go ahead and chase it down, see what you think and come back to us with data. 
So both of these intersections were always stop controlled. The, the project goal was to increase capacity. Um, it took 20 minutes to get through these two intersections combined because on Hitchingham Road to the south here from a mile, there's a charter school in Michigan. Charter schools are not allowed to have busing. So mom and dad have to deliver their children to the school. And at eight o'clock during the day, it was really hairy to get through this intersection. So that was the goal was to increase the capacity by re re getting rid of the always stop controlled intersections and put in the roundabout. So when we shared this concept with Way, I explained to him how the, the approach speeds were 45 to 55 miles an hour. I gave him all the, uh, the ADTs that you see there with 4% trucks. He took that information and he put it into a system, his model, and he looked at it. He says, you know what, Mark? It's going to work. And it's going to work well. They're going to be stressed. Don't get me wrong. But I really feel like this is a good investment that you should make in your community. I can show it to your bosses why. And I think you should do it. And oh, by the way, he was looking for guinea pigs at the time uh, in order to do before and after studies with it. So get a little bit of a sweetener there uh, for us to consider it. But it was a chance we took. And based upon that data, we said, all right, we're gonna, because Wei Zhang believes in this, we're going to take a leap of faith and go with it. What do we got to lose other than our credibility, you know? So we went with the ICD of 90 foot for both of those. Here's the footprint. Uh, and the, the goal for these two intersections was to decrease the footprint of the intersections, but provide the same deflection, entry angle deflection that you would get at a traditional size roundabout that is 130, 140 in size. And that's what we were able to accomplish here. Ultimately, when we went to bid and we built it, now keep in mind, this is in 2015 dollars. So life's changed a little bit since then. We built these things for $800,000, the whole thing. That's $400,000 per intersection. Now, I don't want you to get hung up per se on that number. Now, I think Kentucky and Michigan markets are relatively the same when all things are considered equal. And I, in my, why I'm saying this is on the East Coast, Kentucky, uh, uh, Connecticut in particular, they get there, there's a hang up with Mark. I, it cost me two and a half million dollars, as they try to explain to me, to, to design a traditional, build a traditional size roundabout. We can't get anywhere near 400,000. And I, my explanation to them is like, you know, you're probably right. Our markets are different. Your labor's higher and your materials probably are harder to get. Point is this if you build something smaller, you may not be able to get 400,000 in those dollars, but you might be able to get it down to one and a half million. It isn't one and a half million better than two and a half million. So you're winning from my perspective. That's what I mean by don't get hung up on the numbers that I'm giving you. I'm just trying to show you that you can do more with what you have by doing a smaller footprint at this intersection. It worked out really well here. And here was the key component with the right of way. Now I told you I needed 0.55 acres for the entire traditional roundabout for 140 foot in diameter. With 90 for the Textile Hitchingham intersection, I know I needed 0.03 acres and 0.01 acre here in yellow for Textile Stony Creek. And ultimately, that's a 92% reduction uh, in area compared to the traditional size. The total cost back in 2014 dollars when we paid this, 3575 That appraisal for the project prior to that was over 100000 from our perspective. 300,000 from the owner's perspective. Now, granted, all things being equal, that was, you know, some of this was farmland here and there was commercial there. So perhaps we would have paid more, not perhaps, we would have paid more in value uh, if it were zoned commercial or industrial. But the point is, is that with that smaller footprint, we wouldn't have been barely nearly as much as we did. Uh, it, it, it's, it's night and day difference. So it's a huge benefit. It can be a huge benefit to your budget, from a right-of-way budget. And it can also be a huge benefit to the property and the adjacent property owner in that you're reducing the impacts to that property. So it can be a win-win situation. So this, this might come a lot a little jagged, but we'll give it a shot here. This is a pre-drone. This is what the helicopter back in 2015, Federal Highways paid for this uh, aerial uh, from a helicopter to analyze the intersection after it was built. And this is at eight o'clock in the morning. This is when traffic was its, at its peak period to, for uh, mom and dad to take uh, little Johnny or little Jane to school there. And it is a K through 12. So it, it's, it's more than just little, it's also high schoolers. Point is though, it was working and working really well. 
And the school, the parents at the school were thrilled that they no longer had to wait 20 to 30 minutes every single day to get drop off their children at the school. So huge win for the community um, and not a big hit on the budget of the Washtenaw County Road Commission. This is an example of what the center island looks like for most of our roundabouts. This is not Textile Road. Textile Road is a little bit different scenario. That was a flat intersection. Uh, I know that Janet uh, lived in the UK for a little while, and I wanted to make this a true mini UK version where it was flat across the center, where people could drive or traverse over it without any obstacles whatsoever. Well, in general, it works out well. In the off-peak hours, you'll get about 15% of the drivers that would just drive over it to make a left turn. They won't go around it. And that um, brought some trepidation to some people that view that. So what I ended up doing was raising the center island three to four inches. And that's been our standard here in Washtenaw County. Why three to four inches? It's enough. You, just, you can see all the, the off-tracking here from trucks in all directions. So that's why I picked this example. You know, we have a lot of farm equipment here in Washtenaw County, and I know you do as well as in Kentucky. So it, it provides uh, the combines, it provides the trucks to be able to turn left because it's a smaller footprint. They're not going to be able to stay within that circling roadway. They're going to have to off track and go on to that center island there. So it uh, still allows them to do that without shifting the loads. But the same token, it gives, uh, it, it provides. It, it discourages people in sedans like you see in these cars from driving up and over it and in fact go counterclockwise around it. So we found out this is a good way to go. And here's some before and after photos of the textile at Hitchingham. So AM peak, uh, as I said, took, I lived in a mile from this. So I was pretty well experienced with what happened here. And then um, here's what it was at the same time after the roundabout was built in the fall. So big win-win. All right. Take a breath here. So I'm gonna transition here to the Baker Road roundabout. So Baker Road, I feel is a, a model for not just Kentucky, but for any DOT, uh, whether there might be some guests here from uh, neighboring states, Tennessee or something like that. Um, give me a little background of Baker Road here. So it is the intersection connects to Interstate 94. So that's you know, it goes to Montana to Michigan, but in this case, it's Chicago to Detroit. So that's kind of our regional uh, internetwork of what Interstate 94 services. And Baker Road is what we call an all season roadway. Okay, so it services an industrial park on Dan Hoy Road, which is off the screen here to uh, on the right side. So you have two miles of Baker Road and then it makes a left turn, goes east on Dan Hoy Road to an industrial park. So we have WB 62s and 67s coming from the interstate, going to the interstate back and forth, unloading, loading, uh, bringing materials to this industrial park five days a week, sometimes six. So it was important for us to be able to do some type of project uh, that would accommodate their needs. Why were we here in the first place? Off over to the side on Shield Road is Dexter High School. They have the Dexter Community Campus there. And at two o'clock when uh, the teenagers were let out of school, uh, 2.30 uh, to go home, Shield Road is a two-way stop controlled intersection. Dexter, Baker Road is 55 miles an hour coming into town. And there were, eh, I hate to use the word close calls because it either is a miss or not a miss or near miss, that's the one I, I hate near misses, it's either miss or it's a hit. But the point is, is that there were, there were close calls at that intersection and parents were saying, road commission, we really feel like you need to do something here. After we looked at it, we're like, okay, we agree. Let's put, uh, let's, let's do something. We we're, we're trying to figure out signal or roundabout. Well, ultimately a partner came along with the city of Dexter. They had jurisdiction of the Baker Road at Dan Hoy intersection. They decided to partner with us and say, let's just do something together because it makes sense. So that's what we did. So the project goal was to reduce delay, enhance safety for the students, but also address the trucks. And this is the ultimate footprint after deliberation and having charrettes with the community signal roundabout we ended up going with. Now, a 90 foot intersection, ICD intersection would not work here. Too small with the volumes that we have that I'll show you on the next screen. So ultimately what we ended up doing was going with a hundred foot. So just for another 10 feet, you get a little bit more bang for your buck and it doesn't cost a heck of a lot more to build that. So um, with this, you'll see two, uh, you know, the one over on to the left there. So it's, it's oriented now 
where Interstate 94, as it was to the bottom on the previous screen, is to the left here, and then Dan Hoy Road is to the bottom. The Dan Hoy Road intersection there is elliptical. And the reason why it's elliptical is that we had to reduce those impacts to a cemetery that was there where there's Civil War veterans that are buried in, in, in right in that corner there. So we had no desires to uh, exhume those bodies for any type of intersection improvement project. So we got creative. We ended up building an elliptical that was 105 by 95, which is basically a hundred foot ICD if you were to squish it back to a true circle. Um, now you notice in the last in the last uh, slide there, there is no fourth lane with the Dan Hoy Baker Road intersection. Well, we ended up getting a third partner in this because for Friday Night Lights, uh, the Dexter High School, they wanted to be able to build up to their parking lot another entrance. And we basically said, hey man, uh, you flip the bill, you make uh, the property have uh, work and within so many weeks and sure, we'll let you build a fourth, we'll build a fourth leg for you. And they did. So we ended up having a, uh, that, them as a partner as well. So we had City of Dexter, Dexter Community Schools and uh, federal aid from the, utilized by the Washtenaw County Road Commission. Ultimately, the total cost for this project in an urban environment was sidewalk, street lights, uh, curb and gutter, um, some utility work and storm sewer. I, I can't remember if I said or didn't say that. So if I, if I said it's twice, forgive me. $1.3 million. So ultimately you break that up. That's six, six, uh, 650 per intersection back in 2018 dollars. So again, really stretching our dollar as much as we can to do more with what we have available to us. So here's those statistics I was talking about. So Baker Road, 1,400 vehicles per day. Shield Road, so that's the one over to the left at the high school, 3,200. Dan Hoy, 58. Speeds, depending upon which side you are, 55 coming into town, 35 once you're uh, at the cemetery and going into town. And truck traffic, is it says 3%. But when you got 14%, uh, excuse me, 14,000 vehicles per day, 3%, it's, it's a skewed number. And why I think this intersection works well for any DOT, for the, so in this case, the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, is that it can still address oversized overweight. You know, you got a state trunk line system. You can't just willy nilly tell people, sorry guys, you can't go there. You can't get your trucks through there. You have to be able to provide that. We have a little bit more uh, flexibility at a county level to tell people you can't get there from here. But at the state level, can't do that. And I understand that. But this type of an intersection design will accommodate those types of WB67s. Now, if you got a little bit of a special move with windmills and stuff like that, eh, maybe not. But for the most part, I really feel like this is a great use of taxpayer dollars to address safety and enhance uh, the capacity at intersections that you may be experiencing that with gridlock throughout the state of Kentucky. So here's that example of the truck that's maneuvering left uh, going from, this is Dan Hoy, uh, going north eastbound on Dan Hoy from southbound uh, Baker Road there. So it's, it's off tracking onto the center island uh, that's raised about three inches. So again, no shifting to traffic works out just fine. Uh, here's a bird's eye view of a Miller light truck. So I, ironically, I, I think it's the exact same truck you're gonna see in the next video from a different day. That is going from Dan Hoy Road to Baker Road. And hopefully you're seeing this on, uh, it's not uh, jagged on your side of the world. So it made a direct left turn. Now it's heading towards the interstate. Now, I wish the drone operator caught the, the other half of this. It's going towards now Shield Road. And then you're going to magically see, voila, another truck that's going to be heading to Dan Hoy Road. Unfortunately, the drone uh, operator did not continue the video. So I uh, wish he did. So you could see him turn uh, or her uh, turn. Uh, that would have been right onto Dan Hoy Road. But say Levy. So really successful project. People in the community loved the project. It worked well. Here's this video I was talking about with the Miller Light truck. Uh, you'll, you'll see it. Snow, not a big deal. I know you don't get as much snow in Kentucky as you do in Michigan, but those sizes, it works out just fine. 100 with the front plow, you're not going to have any issues whatsoever. So here's a truck going from Interstate 94 to Dan Hoy, turning right. Easy peasy. And here comes Mr. Light. 
So clearly there's a distribution center within the area in the district park. And he waves to me, I got a way back to the guy. Now you're gonna notice he's gonna off track on the center island as he waits, he yields, has his gap, enters the roundabout, off tracks onto the center island. Just like others have. And away we go. Off to make the next delivery. And what about pedestrians? So Friday Night Lights I was talking about. So uh, it worked out really well for them too. I've got video footage of different uh, age types using it. So mom and dad taking their children to the game. And you're gonna see another clip here. I got four of them in particular. Here's another one. I, I, speculating mom and friend and daughter. So traffic's yielding, six o'clock. So you can see it's coming into town heavily, but you know, that, that's a normal day at that intersection there. Then now you got a bunch of middle schoolers going to the game unsupervised, but traffic stopping for them as well. So this is really good video to show that uh, the smaller type roundabouts can work for pedestrians too under the right circumstances. And grandma and grandpa taking grandson to the game. All good. Very fortunate to have, I felt to have the, the videos there. And you can see the traffic died down a little bit by 6.30 there from memory. Okay, so that is in uh, the, the background of the Baker Road experience. So uh, wrapping up here on time so I can give my, uh, my esteemed colleague, Mike, uh, some time here as well to share his experiences. I'm gonna give you a little bit of those trade-offs I was talking about. So we talked about the bang for your buck. So this one, I don't have, uh, in, a, in an interest of time, I don't have uh, slides on this, uh, but Moomin Bemis was one I built in 2018 for an ICD of 82 feet. So it's the smallest one I built. Now I would not, I would not suggest you do this type of intersection on, on state trunk line system, but for a county and local road with 55 miles an hour coming in, it works and it works well, very stressed, but nonetheless, it works out well. We end up spending $300,000 to a contractor to build that in 2018 dollars. It was an always stop controlled intersection to delay 120 seconds plus on any given day. And what so that level of service F plus, plus, plus and peak entering volumes 1500. Now that's a, that's a key component right there, 1500. Why do I say that? It's really important that you place these intersections at the right locations because they will break. What do I mean by break? If you put too much vehicles in that intersection at a given time within an hour, it will be gridlocked. And you're gonna need to size the roundabout accordingly to handle that peak hour factor. People ask me, hey, Mark, what's, what's the maximum ADT that you can have for the mini? The answer is, doesn't matter, it's not relevant. It's what is at the peak hour that it can handle. You start getting to 1500 in the peak hour, you get stressed. You get to 1800, you're gonna be breaking it from my perspective. And then, so if you know you're gonna have some growth in the area uh, from, uh, you know, the projections are from the MPO, you're gonna have some growth coming into the area. Eh, you may wanna build a little bit more uh, buffer into that and build a little bit bigger roundabout. But the point is, is you still don't need to go all the way up to a 130, 140 per se. You might be able to go to with a 100 or a 110, which is still winning from my perspective when it comes to saving resources. So after we built the roundabout there with an ICD of 82, end up going from a level of service F overall AM and PM to level of service B and an A in the, in the, in the uh, morning and afternoon. So huge win for the community for $300,000. Now, let's talk about the, the, the trade-off per se. And this is what I want everyone to understand clearly. And it's not the only one, but it's the main one. With roundabouts in general, there can be confusion. <laughs> there can be some uh, trepidation with the roundabout itself. And which leads to what we call the, the, the terminology for a roundabout is a failure to yield, where someone doesn't yield the right of way to someone already in the roundabout circulating. And they think they have a gap or they don't know they should have a gap and they enter and there's a, there's a, a slight collision, what I like to call a fender bender or a deductible crash, okay? With the mini roundabout, when you start shrinking that footprint down from say 140 down to 100 or 90, the distance between the entry points shrinks just enough where if you shave away about one second of perception reaction time, 
there is a chance for gap selection to de decrease at peak periods to the point where it may cause more fender benders to happen. On average, I'm experiencing at our seven mini smaller roundabouts here, you had before the roundabout five crashes per year, but out of those five, most people were getting injured, some severely, some deaths, as a matter of fact. After we built those, we we're getting fifth, eight to 15 PDO, we call that property damage only in Michigan, perhaps you use the same term in Michigan, uh, Kentucky, per year. So we're trading off the number per se is going from five, anywhere from a range of eight to 15. So people are like, oh my gosh, how can you be so careless? How can you be so reckless? How can you just waste taxpayer dollars like that? From our perspective, that's not how we do it. We're saving lives. We're making the intersection more safe. Where the trade-off though, is that there are more fender bender accidents that happen in that intersection. So if you understand that trade-off that you're getting into, from our perspective, it's it's one that's fair to make when you when you look at it from cost, life saved, fewer injuries, capacity, safer, uh, uh, better for the environment. If you believe in that type of stuff, with emissions going into the atmosphere, fewer impacts to property owners, right away costs down, um, less time to build it for a smaller roundabout. You're going to have to close the entire intersection. So you get in, you get out. Sometimes you can do this within five or six weeks. So I like to call it expedite the pain. You factor all that in, we feel we're doing the right thing here in Washtenaw County. But just, just because that means it's right and accepted here in Washtenaw by our community doesn't necessarily mean it'll be the same for you folks in Kentucky. So just make sure you understand that before you enter the uh, ring of smaller roundabouts in your community. So getting going back to the act of Pontiac Trail and Seven Mile, I told you that we had to walk away from that project. Well, fortunately, back last year during COVID, we were able to build the mini take two of a, a 90 foot ICD there. You see the party store up in the Northeast corner. We ended up having to uh, pay $30,000 uh, for right of way costs still uh, on the uh, North, uh, variant straight here, Northwest and South uh, West corners there. But again, 300,000, 30,000, big win. We ultimately just wrote the guy a check because we didn't feel like going to court and fighting and haggling over it and paying attorneys and making, giving them uh, more money to send their kids to private school. So ultimately, it's a decision we made and we feel it's a great decision. Community really loves this roundabout, working out really well. Traffic jams, jams, uh, gridlock, uh, the, the, the backups gone. And the mini took care of it. So recipes for success from my perspective. First and foremost, minimum, I've gone to 82, keep it at 90 foot from my perspective. You're not gonna save a lot more. It's, it's a point of diminishing returns at that point. I think you're better off served by keeping it at 90 foot and going to greater at that point. People seem to love the sweet spot between 100 and 110. If you got the right way to do it, you got the means to do it, great, go ahead and do it. And sometimes you have to based on the capacity of the intersection, your peak hour factors. So, but in general, people tend to like the sweet spot because the number one complaint you're gonna get if you build a 90 foot ICD is it's too small and they wanna shoot you out of a canyon, <laughs> okay? But in time, I think a lot of it is just because uh, you know, circa 2000, when we built the larger size intersections, people had the same opinion about us as who brought these things to America and why do we have them? One time people got used to them. And I think they just become so conditioned to the larger intersections that now we just got to get them conditioned to the smaller type intersections as well. That's just my view. Always stop control is better than a two-way stop controlled intersection. From my perspective, that's because people are already conditioned to stop. It's not that you can't do a two-way stop controlled intersection, but I think you're better off by using an always stop control if you have the availability to do one there. Use realistic growth factors because if you don't, you're just going to be building something bigger and for, for spending more money that you don't necessarily need to do. Buying is critical. Make sure you talk to your fire marshals, your fire chiefs, your police officers, your city councils, your mayors, your townships, whoever, the jurisdiction, how it works in Kentucky. Get that buy-in before you start going to the public because you want them on your team. You want them supporting you saying, yes, we believe in this. And then ultimately monitor your, monitor your results because if you don't and you just walk away from it, you don't really know what's working, and what's not working and what needs to be tweaked in your communities in order for the next one to be better than the first one. So with that, I say thank you. I really appreciate everyone's time here. I'm honored to be able to speak to you. I'm gonna turn the mic over here to Mike uh, Vaughn to let him uh, share his experiences. And then uh, we'll let Janet go from there with Q&A. And so I'm gonna stick around here and uh, wait for that experience. So uh, baton is now yours, Mr. Vaughn. 
Right. I think you'll have to stop sharing. I stuff. am right now. Right. So y'all, I, I, I stopped. What do yeah, you got on I'm, your side? It's coming up. Oh, okay. In a sec. All right. Can you guys mute myself? So you, you, uh, yep. the mic is yours. Uh, so I'm going to try to be fairly brief. Here's what I'm going to cover. I uh, thought I'd start with a bit of the reason why Kentucky's HSIP is interested in many roundabouts. And I'll talk a little on our first mini roundabout. Um, uh, we are just a point of clarification. We are doing a, a several mini roundabouts in the city of Elizabethtown. Our first one was actually over in District 9 in Bath County. Um, so I've talked to Mark about a lot of what we're doing and he just got a little mixed up on which one came first. Our ones in E-Town are very, very, very close. Um, but then I'll finish up with um, just a brief highlight of some of those other HSIP funded mini roundabouts that are in the works. Like I said, there are several in the city of Elizabethtown. So let's start with why Kentucky's HSIP is interested in mean roundabouts. Well, at the most basic level, the answer to that question is because people's lives matter. Now, I say this because of some of the phenomenal safety benefits that roundabouts can provide. Um, before and after research shows that roundabouts can have anywhere from 60 to 80 percent fewer fatal and injury crashes when compared to signalized intersections. And a big reason for this is the reduction in conflict points. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term conflict point, it's fairly simple. Basically a conflict point is anywhere the path of two users intersect. Um, and those conflict points, those uh, intersections of user paths become collisions if one or both of the users make a mistake. So conflict points are an indicator of safety uh, on our roadway system. Um, now, Mark, well, let me back up. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So a roundabout has eight total conflict points, whereas a traditional intersection has 32. Um, probably more impressive is a roundabout has zero crossing conflict points, whereas a traditional intersection has 16. Um, and a crossing conflict is the type of conflict that leads to angle, also known as T-bone collisions. Um, so if you just simply can't get into a T-bone crash, which is the type of crash that tends to create the more severe injuries and, and death, then you just automatically created a big win for intersection safety. Now, like Mark mentioned, property damage only crashes might go up sometimes by a fair amount, but if we really think about what matters, which is saving lives and reducing serious injuries, do we really care if there's a few more fender benders? Um, if that means that the likelihood of fatal and injury crashes will be much less? The answer is obviously no. We can accept a few more fender benders if it does mean we're going to likely save lives. And I think when Congress established the HSIP, they sort of saw that too. And, and they made it clear in the federal regulations that the purpose of the HSIP was to achieve a significant reduction in traffic fatalities and serious injuries. There's no mention of reducing fender benders because in the grand scheme of things, fender benders and other low severity crashes are just not that worrisome compared to the more severe in serious injury and fatal collisions. Now, with this goal of achieving significant reductions in fatal and serious injury crashes in mind, Kentucky's HSIP strongly believes that our best chance of success of that goal is gonna come if we invest in projects that provide exceptional value. Now, I define exceptional value as high benefit at a low cost. Uh, so let's go back to our why many roundabouts question. Well, it comes down uh, to the fact that many roundabouts can provide exceptional value. Um, and here's sort of my logic chain. Uh, many roundabout is an inscribed diameter of 90 foot or smaller. As Mark said, we do sometimes build them just a touch bigger. I think most of the industry calls that a compact urban. It's still on the smaller side, but the point is smaller footprint. A smaller footprint then means less right of way and utility impacts and just construction costs. Um, and less impact and less construction, less cost to implement the solution. Um, and a few slides ago, I 
sort of already established that roundabouts can provide great safety benefits. So we're at that really high benefit, lower cost, therefore exceptional value. So all of that together is sort of what really has, has led us into looking at, at many roundabouts with our HSIP dollars. Um, similar to what Mark said, we're funding's tight. So finding those great values is, is a big way and a recipe for success. All right, so we'll jump into our uh, Bath County uh, case study. It's at Kentucky's first mini roundabout. It's at the intersection of US 60 and Kentucky 801. Um, both roads are very, very similar at this intersection. Both are rural two lane major collectors. Both have an ADT of about 4,500 vehicles per day um, and both with about six and a half percent trucks. And then the posted speed limit um, is 55. So similar to the, the examples Mark showed, um, somewhat of a high speed approach at, at this roundabout. This uh, location is near the community of farmers. Uh, it's just north of Cave Run Lake. Uh, and in fact, Kentucky 801 is, is essentially the, the, it directly serves Cave Run, uh, Cave Run Lake. Another interesting fact is, uh, US 60 and then the north leg of Kentucky 801 serve as a detour when there are incidents on I-64. Um, and essentially the US 60 Kentucky 801 intersection is really the only major intersection you have to navigate along that detour. Now you might be wondering, well, why am I pointing that out? Well, it's because this intersection was a four-way stop. So you can imagine how backed up things would get when detoured interstate traffic came through this intersection. On a normal day, the four-way stop was doing okay. Um, we didn't have any, any major huge peak hours or anything. So it was doing okay outside of when we had detour traffic, but um, you know, when, when interstate traffic needed to come through here, it was a mess. Uh, this is a picture uh, traveling eastbound uh, as you approach, eastbound on US 60 as you approach the intersection. Um, and then this is a picture traveling southbound on 801 as you approach the intersection. Now, you probably notice that in both photos, um, we had uh, dual mounted sort of rather large stop signs. Um, and this is the case on all four legs. I don't have photos of all four legs, but it's the same setup on all four legs. Um, the reason for that is over the years, we've had a bit of crash history. I mean, going back many, many years. And so, uh, several years ago, we uh, installed oversized stop signs uh, on both sides of the road. We installed uh, oversized stop ahead signs, you know, five or 600 feet back from the intersection on the approach to try to grab people's attention. And we also installed an overhead flashing beacon, you know, again, attempt to get people's attention. But um, th those countermeasures helped to an extent, but um, we were studying the US 60 corridor and um, as part of that study, we noticed it's like, man, we've got this four-way stop and we've got these countermeasures are, that are designed to really draw attention to the intersection, but we're still seeing some somewhat moderate number of angle crashes producing a few injuries. Um, and so we sort of felt like there was more yet to do that, that even though four-way stops traditionally do a pretty good job for improving safety, we just weren't quite there yet with this one. And so um, we uh, had recently, like Mark mentioned, uh, me and some others had went up to Michigan at a roundabout, uh, a mini roundabout symposium and, and learned about the success that Mark and his team were having. And so we were looking at this location about that same time frame, and, and we came back with the, hey, we think this, this will be a good spot to, to try this. Um, so we uh, uh, had our design team set out developing a layout. Um, you, what they came up with is what you see here. It is a 90 foot uh, diameter. Uh, the circulatory roadway is 20 foot wide. Uh, we use fairly long splitter islands just because those approach speeds were or could be on the higher side. Uh, splitter islands in the range of 100 to 150 feet. Um, the best news, um, once we put it out to bid, the low bid come in at just a little over 617000 So similar to the uh, price range that Mark has described in some of his examples. Um, and, and in Kentucky, a, a larger roundabout would have been more like a million, million and a half. So we, we come in half to a third cheaper um, 
which is really great news. Gets back to that exceptional value uh, mentality. So I'm gonna pause here. I'm gonna show you some drone footage. I don't have as fancy of a presentation. I've got to exit out to show you my drone footage, but everybody loves drone footage. So uh, let's hop over to that. Um, I mentioned that Cave Run Lake is just to the south of this intersection. So we do see a lot of uh, boat traffic. Um, here we see a pickup truck pulling a boat, a boat easily navigating um, the new roundabout. Um, and then if you look, we, you know, this is a somewhat busy time of the day. The, the vehicles are, are interacting pretty well as well. You know, speeds are calm and slow. They're getting through the intersection fairly easily. Um, and I think in just a second, we're gonna have another pickup. Yeah, there he comes. Another pickup truck pulling a utility trailer. Um, so similar to the previous truck with the boat, but he also, or she, is able to navigate the intersection fairly easily. Um, of course, you might be wondering, well, hey, you know, pickup trucks and trailers, that's all well and good, but what about bigger stuff? So in this drone footage, we have a over-the-road tractor trailer, a WB67, you see him coming uh, eastbound toward the intersection. Um, he has to take it sort of slow, and you'll see it, that he, he kind of crawls through here, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Low speeds are, are good. Low kinetic energy should you get into a collision, but the, the tractor can easily navigate around the circular territory roadway. Um, the trailer easily mounts the, uh, the, the central island. We used a three-inch hop on that, um, and he's on his way. Easy peasy. Fast forward a bit, because we've got another truck. Uh, in the same clip. This is more of a regional size truck. Um, what's interesting with this one is, um, you know, this guy, even though this is a small roundabout, this guy's able to traverse through the intersection and doesn't even mount the center island. Um, so even though it's a small size, you can fit pretty big things through here without even mounting the islands. So just goes to show that um, don't, don't get, don't get scared of the, the fact that it's smaller. Um, smaller doesn't necessarily mean uh, worse or whatever. All right, I'll finish up with um, just this last slide here talking about uh, several of the many roundabouts that we have under design and development. Um, like I said, in, in Elizabethtown, we do have seven. These are all on city streets intersecting other city streets. Um, and, and all of these are, are relatively low speed, uh, low volume. Uh, we will have some of these that will be uh, much smaller than 90 feet. Um, I think we've got some that are in the 70 foot diameter range, maybe even some around 60. I can't remember the exact details right off the top of my head. Um, the two on North Main, the very top two on this list, they've actually been let to construction, just work hasn't started. We expect the construction work to start in the next few days, maybe a week or so. Um, and they're, they're supposed to be finished up by uh, the end of June. Uh, we've uh, very close to the, the Woodland Drive in Layman Lane. That one is really close to being let to construction. We expect it to, to go out for bids in July. And then the, the rest of them we're anticipating being under contract uh, later this fall or winter to be constructed uh, next summer. We've also got three other mini roundabouts on state highway intersections, um, one in Laurel County, one in Bell County, one in Harlan. Uh, the one in Harlan County, it's a, a little more developed than the other two. We anticipate it'll be under contract in July. Um, and the other two hopefully will be under contract by the uh, late winter, early spring next year. So that, that's it for what I have. Um, I really appreciate um, everybody uh, joining today. And uh, like Mark mentioned, we, we can take a few questions, I think, if anybody has any. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mark and Mike, for sharing with us this morning. And thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to join us. I've put some links in the chat. Um, the top ones are evaluation link. We do appreciate hearing from you guys, especially if you have a question about roundabouts, if you have a suggestion for a webinar Wednesday topic, or if you have another suggestion for us. And then uh, the others are some of our other training offerings. 
local governments on the call. If you have a question about roundabouts, especially specific to your city or county, uh, fill out that technical assistance form and we'll connect you with one of our engineers, get you some more help with that. Um, otherwise, we will stick around for some questions. If you don't have a question, you're welcome to jump off uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks again for joining us.